Calling all volume seekers, ditch the products that just don't work. Living Proof's new technology delivers bigger hair that lasts. No teasing required. Use the code VOLUME at livingproof.com for a free travel size full dry volume blast with your $20 order. We are the science, you are the living proof. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will deliver seasonal recipes with pre measured ingredients to make delicious home cooked meals for less than $10 each. Get three meals free with free shipping at blueapron.com slash modern. That's slash modern. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. David Kalish and his wife Ingrid had high hopes for their new relationship. They were married on a Sunday, and the following Tuesday, they got a phone call that changed everything, for better and for worse. Dash Myhawk, you may know him from his role as Bunchy in the Showtime series Ray Donovan, he reads this week's essay, A Path to Fatherhood with Shared Morning Sickness. Three weeks before my wife Ingrid and I were to move to Mexico, where a coveted job awaited me, my doctor phoned with results from my latest CT scan. My thyroid cancer had spread to my lungs. He suggested I see an oncologist right away. I let the phone go silent. My excitement over the job as foreign correspondent for the Associated Press had been building for months. We had sublet our Brooklyn apartment, put a deposit on one in Mexico City, and sold our car. We had also married, not just for love, but so that Ingrid, a Colombian doctor on a student visa, could travel freely across borders with me. My cancer had been stable in recent years, and I was itching to start my new life. Suddenly, everything felt shaky. How could this happen? Now was the time for packing and saying goodbye to old friends, not visiting new doctors. Something hardened inside me. When Ingrid arrived home that evening, I played down the news. I had spots on my lungs, but they were all under a third of an inch. Nothing I can't take care of in Mexico, I said. We leave in three weeks. No way I'm squeezing in another appointment. Ingrid's eyes glistened. Have fun in Mexico, she said. Because I'm not going anywhere if you don't take care of yourself first. A passionate woman who speaks from the gut, Ingrid is no stranger to setbacks. She had watched her father die in a Colombian hospital the victim of a carjacking gone awry. Speaking little English, she had fled the violence there to become a doctor in America, cleaning houses to pay her way. She married me knowing all about my disease, a rare, incurable form of thyroid cancer which had required three neck operations. But she wasn't about to watch another man she loved die. Make the call, she said. A few days later, an oncologist was urging me to start a drug regimen at his clinic as soon as possible. I had a better idea. Just give me the recipe, I told him. I would share it with a doctor in Mexico and get treated there. Ingrid shot me a scolding look. The doctor frowned. It's not like you're making enchiladas, he said. These drugs can have nasty side effects. This is not the time to move to another country. On the ride home, I said to Ingrid, Why doesn't anyone understand? Being a foreign correspondent is my dream. It's like when you move to America to practice medicine. Dreams are good for your health. I didn't have lung spots and I wasn't moving to the air pollution capital of Latin America, she said. If you don't take care of yourself, nothing else matters. The next week... I canceled the appointment with the international movers, forfeited my deposit on the apartment in Mexico, and scanned the classified ads for a used car in Brooklyn. 
I settled back into my position on the AP's international desk, editing articles by reporters in exotic places that reminded me, painfully, of the job I had given up. My ordeal had barely begun. With chemotherapy starting in two months, the oncologist suggested I freeze my sperm for later use because the regimen can damage sex cells. Ingrid had another idea. We could make a baby now, the natural way, she said. I suppressed a laugh. With my career sandbagged and chemotherapy looming, I couldn't even contemplate becoming a father. I would be nauseated and balding, in no shape to chase after a baby with a leaky diaper. Ingrid stood her ground. Thawed-out sperm are notoriously unreliable, she said. She had delivered hundreds of babies in Colombia and believed bearing a child was a privilege not to be taken lightly. This could be our last chance. I threw up my hands. I could only hope we would fail to conceive in the narrow window before the start of my regimen. But wouldn't you know, three weeks later, Ingrid waved the positive test strip in my bewildered face, then our marriage entered a new phase. Around the time I underwent my first treatment, Ingrid was hit with morning sickness. Our side effects and symptoms were suddenly on parallel tracks. I woke up one morning feeling queasy and achy from my first treatment, listening to the whir of a portable pack pumping the drugs through a steel medical port in my chest. Bile crawled up my throat as I staggered to the bathroom and vomited in the toilet. Seconds later, Ingrid burst in, looking as pale as I felt, and vomited too. After gargling, she said, "'Do me a favor and vomit more softly.' I don't want to hear your inner pig. You don't know how sick I feel. Oh, but I think I do. In fact, I was that rare husband who knew exactly how sick my pregnant wife felt. A week later, our symptoms overlapped again. I discovered a clump of hair in the shower drain and a bald patch on my head. At the same time, Ingrid, her body flooded with hormones, discovered peach fuzz growing in surprising places, around her navel and on her neck. She was wide-eyed with concern. I reached into the shower drain and grabbed my hairball. You think that's bad? I have a clump. She touched my scalp, smiling weakly. We both have nausea, she said. You're losing hair. I have hair in new places. We both have growths inside us. Don't you see? Me and you, we're connected. In no mood to celebrate our newfound solidarity, I drew away. If your bad hair bothers you, let me shave you, she said. Lots of sexy men are bald. Bruce Willis, Agassiz. No need for your head to look like a bad lawn. I said, sure, go ahead, but first let me shave your peach fuzz. She turned away. So it will grow back as stubble? You're not helping me one bit. Ingrid and her hormones stalked out, sucking the air out of the bathroom. It wasn't so much that I didn't sympathize with my wife, but my own misery left me less able to cope with hers. Our similarities then dovetailed even more. As we both struggled to hold down food, I lost weight and Ingrid didn't gain enough. In fact, she was eating even less than me, preferring hot chocolate instead of dinner. I pictured our tiny little child trapped in her womb, pumped up with sugar. For the first time, I started to worry more about the growth inside of her than the one in me. Ingrid, listen to me, I said. The baby needs to eat, and you're the only restaurant in town. That night, I dreamed that Ingrid gave birth to a tumor while a surgeon extracted a fetus from my throat. 
I jerked awake to the glare of the morning sun, feeling famished and nauseated. Pulling a baseball cap over my patchy scalp, I went out to forage for food that wouldn't make me gag. At a bodega, an idea struck me. I bought a loaf of bimbo, a crunchy Hispanic-style bread Ingrid once told me she liked, and brought it to her. She closed her eyes and took a bite, then blinked as if waking from a dream. Wait until I tell my mother you're feeding our baby Colombian food. She crunched some more, reminiscing about how she ate bimbo as a girl. And the fruits in Colombia, the papayas are so ripe and sweet. A tear slipped down her cheek as she rambled on nostalgically. You're eating, I whispered as I also ate a slice, feeling the tension in me dissipate. Maybe we can get a group rate on lumpectomies, I joked. Please don't call our baby a lump, she said, cracking a smile. As the months to Ingrid's due date fell away, our baby grew big and strong inside her. Alas, in this, too, my wife and I were on similar paths. Despite the harsh chemotherapy regimen, the spots on my lungs were growing inside of me, too, and the doctors seemed powerless to stop them. On a glorious evening in February, Ingrid gave birth by cesarean section to a healthy eight-pound girl named Sophie, whose screams filled the room as a nurse handed her to me in a tightly wrapped bundle. I handed her to Ingrid, who brought her to her breast. As pale streetlight filtered in, all I heard was suckling. Our story could have ended here, with Sophie's face scrunched against my wife's milk-swollen bosom. That would have been enough for me. But it didn't end there. I went on medical leave to become a stay-at-home father. I switched from chemo to an experimental drug that, despite a few setbacks and scares, managed to hold my cancer at bay. The three of us moved from Brooklyn to upstate New York, where come summers, we sow tomato and basil in our garden, and where our chemo baby, now 15, fills our home with art and laughter and piano music. Lumps and all, not a bad deal. Dash Myhawk, reading David Kalish's essay, A Path to Fatherhood with Shared Morning Sickness. We'll check in with David and Ingrid after the break. Living Proof delivers bigger hair that lasts. Product tester Jamie explains what full dry volume blast does for her. What they tested a lot on my hair was kind of the next day result. So they were looking for how long did this volume really stay? Once you applied it, did it fall flat in a few hours? And it really doesn't. In fact, in my hair, I think it looks better 24 hours after. It just, the hair held amazingly well and it was ready to go. It looked incredible. Use the code VOLUME at livingproof.com for a free travel size full dry volume blast with your $20 order. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. And now a postscript from Daniel Jones, the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times, and this week's writer David Kalish with his wife Ingrid Bermudez. Before David and Ingrid met, they emailed back and forth for about a month. We started by asking David about the first time they actually met. I arranged our first in-person date at a coffee house in Manhattan where I was reading an excerpt of my fiction, and the excerpt happened to be based on my experience with cancer. And she came into the room just before I started reading, and she um, was sitting in the back listening, and I was kind of nervous. What is she thinking? She hadn't known about this before. And after the reading, I went up to her and I said, so what did you think? And one of the first things she said to me, was it fact or fiction? 
and I kind of had a little bit of a moment there. And she's fine with it. She still is fine with it. Maybe because I'm a doctor and I see the conditions like a part of the life. So I guess I was not that impressed. I just like him with everything included with the whole package. (laughs) And how did David seal the deal? I kind of asked Ingrid in a casual way, do you want to go to Hong Kong with me? And she was like, you know. Sure, I can go. Sure. But I was in a student visa, so you have to marry me. Yeah, and then she said, <laughs> I, have to, she, I have to do the marrying thing. And I kind of got pretty tense at that point because I'd already been married. And then it ended up that AP offered this Mexico job. So I prefer that because it was closer to home and I've always had a thing for Latin America. Yeah, he had a girlfriend in Mexico. Well, that's, that's a different story. We realized that we did have to get married, and we did. And it wasn't just for the papers, obviously. It was because we were really into it. But I think if we hadn't had to get married at that point, I probably would have waited, a, you know, another year or two. Maybe a month. Maybe a month. <laughs> <laughs> what I liked about David's essay is his relationship with his wife and how they balance each other in terms of levels of denial, I guess. The, the line that he says to her, dreams are good for your health, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. There's a, there's a lot of truth to having something out in your future and planning for a future, whether you think you're going to be alive for that future or not. And I just love how they each have this sense of we're going to move ahead no matter what. When Ingrid looks back at this story and her drive to get pregnant, she laughs and admits that it was pretty crazy. I remember David telling me that what's going to happen if, if I die, it doesn't work, you're going to be alone. You know, I just say, I just managed. I just, we are women, you know, we're strong, we, we bear the babies and we keep it with us, with, with or without a man. I was dazed enough that I accepted it at the time and just kind of hope that we got through it. And I was grateful that Ingrid wasn't really afraid of anything. We like to think these days that marriage is egalitarian in every way and that earning is equal and childcare is equal. But there's some experiences that are purely for the man or the woman. And pregnancy is, is thought to be one of those experiences that is just for the woman. Uh, and, and as I waded into David's essay and saw what he was doing and what he'd experienced with experiencing her symptoms as she was experiencing them, and that level of, uh, of sort of partnership and shared experience and empathy as they both have things growing inside of them, one uh, that's about life and one that's about death. They are experiencing all these things Together, um, you, could, you could think of them as being the ultimate modern marriage in that sense. So how is David today? My lung spots have not increased. They've diminished a little bit. Certainly not anything like normal. I mean, it's one of these deals where you don't cure your cancer or go into remission. You're actually holding it at bay. It becomes a chronic disease, basically. It becomes like a chronic disease, yeah. yeah. So, and, and through it all, um, my daughter grew up. And I was a primary uh, caregiver. I, that was a real gift. I mean, honestly, in some ways, I'm glad. I feel lucky that I had this opportunity in my life to create space for raising Sophie. And about Sophie, David and Ingrid say she doesn't worry too much about the cancer. She's usually more stressed out about that week's homework. But David says his philosophy of living in the moment, due in large part to his cancer diagnosis, affects the way he parents Sophie. And I've kind of drilled that home. You gotta, you can't waste your life with distractions. You really have to get to the heart of the matter and figure out what it is you want to do, what, what do you feel passionate about, and pursue that in whatever way you know best. David Kalish, writer of this week's essay, A Path to Fatherhood with Shared Morning Sickness. David's latest novel is The Opposite of Everything. You also heard from David's wife, Ingrid Bermudez, and Dan Jones, editor of Modern Love for The New York Times. More in a minute.
Not all ingredients are created equal. Blue Apron sources fresh, high-quality ingredients and sends them right to your home in pre-measured packages. You get easy-to-follow recipes, so you can have a meal ready in 40 minutes or less. There's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want. Check out this week's menu and get three meals free, with free shipping, by going to blueapron.com modern. New recipes are created each week. That's blueapron.com modern. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. So as you know, we have incredible actors read for us every week on Modern Love. The question is, which essay should we ask them to read? We can't have expected them to read every essay that's ever appeared in the New York Times. So here's what we do. We dive deep into their backgrounds, their interests, and their body of work to find the Modern Love essays that might resonate most deeply with them. We send the actors a few of those, and then they pick the one they want. And then after they record, we're always interested to ask why they chose that particular essay. Here's what Dash Myhawk said about why he chose David Kalish's piece. This story spoke to me because I'm a father and a recent one, and I'm very private about it. Um, but it's, it's an incredible thing um, to get to be a dad, and the fact that this man went through this and got through it and that he's able to enjoy his child now is uh, is such a beautiful, touching thing. And uh, I shed a tear and um, I just thought it was, was really beautiful. Thanks again to Dash My Hawk. Ray Donovan returns for a fifth season in 2017 on Showtime. Dash is also a musician and a new album with his band Diz and the Fam will be out later this year. There's more information on our website, wbur.org slash modern love. And while you're there, check out our plans for Modern Love Live. We're excited to announce that Lucius will be our house band for the night. Here's a bit of their latest song, Pulling Teeth, out on Mom and Pop Music. Pulling teeth out one by one We're still getting nothing Lucius is on the road this year supporting their album Good Grief. We'll have a link to tour dates at wbur.org slash modern love. Before we go, here's a little preview of next week from Fresh Off the Boat's Constance Wu. Miles was the best of her. He had her face, her build, her Texas twang. As much as he was to me, he was more to her, more viscerally hers. They shared DNA, for God's sake. Never miss an episode of Modern Love. Subscribe right now on your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, leave us a review. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, and Amory Sievertson. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Our casting consultant is Amy Lippins, CSA. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.